On today's episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, we meet once again with Deborah Battersby, the creator of the Freedom Point System of Coaching. Deborah was asked, how does this actually work? And she delivered. Stay tuned. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. All right, so I am back with Deborah Battersby. Deborah, it's always nice to see you. It's lovely to see you and to have fun adventures because I know we could talk for hours about all kinds of stuff. So I'm excited to find out what we're going to explore today. Oh, well, we'll find out because we never know until we start talking sometimes. But um, I, I do have some questions that I uh, wanted to ask you ever since we had our previous conversation. Um, and I, the most burning question I'm going to force myself to put off till later that I really want to talk to you about. But before I get to that, <laughs> I, I do want to ask you about um, part of your work that you started to talk about last time, but it didn't give us the whole the whole kit and caboodle. I, I got to miss a bit of the kit, but not the caboodle part. And I, I want it all. Okay. <laughs> I want it all. So I was wondering if you could lay out for us um, your freedom point technique um, has an acronym within it. The point is P period, O period, I period, M period, T period. And um, could you tell us what that stands for, what that is all about? Yeah, you know, when when I finally decided, it was probably about 10 years ago that I realized that it was time for me to teach other people the the model that I kind of evolved over, you know, my experiences, my downloads and and the brilliant teachers that I've had and the things I've studied over the years. And so Ultimately, you know, there have been a number of renditions of this formula over the last 20 years. And when I was explaining to people, you know, what happens when we get into this subconscious work? And I said, look, what we're always looking for is the freedom point. We're looking for the point at which the subconscious is ready, willing, and able to change things, where it's willing to engage in a whole new program. And so I said, so the work is about getting the client to that point in this conversation with the subconscious where everything is free to be recreated. And so as I was thinking about Freedom Point, I thought, well, what are the what are the things that happen in this process? And I remember the outline that I had started uh, or that I had used in my first uh, evolution of teaching this work. And it was, it was, uh, it was not uh, acronym. It was uh, like all like four or five, I think it was seven R's actually. And the first one was about rapport, about creating rapport. And then it was about, you know, the, the responsibility of the, the practitioner in the process. And there were all kinds of other elements to it. And that evolved into um, another acronym over the years. And, and But as I kept explaining to people that, you know, we're looking for the freedom point. And I use that expression so many times that I thought, oh, that's what I need to call this work. It's it's freedom point. That's what we're looking for. Everybody wants to be free to be true to themselves. They, they want the freedom to be authentic with all without all the baggage of what other people expect and what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to be and whether or not they're worthy enough. And so I thought, OK, if that's what we're looking for. And as coaches, I think we're all in the freedom business. You know, we want to help people free their potential. We want to liberate people to be, you know, to express their full capacity. So I thought, okay, this makes sense to me. And then I was thinking about 
as we guide someone through this experience, what are the steps we take them through? And I thought, well, the first thing we have to do is prepare the client. And I always use the word, you know, that essentially the big part of what we're doing is we're negotiating with the subconscious. There's a negotiation going on and there, the negotiation has to be successful to reach that freedom point. So I'm noticing that. And then, and what's the outcome we want? The outcome is transformation. Is that the outcome? Uh, no, the outcome. Not, not necessarily, but okay, it, so, so, it, so I realized that, okay, I've got preparation, negotiation, and transformation. I've got three letters of point right there. So this allowed for a little creative license. What did I do with the O and the I? And I thought, okay, what are we doing with the client? And even though we're in inquiry, we are, you know, we're asking questions, but what we're really doing is looking for patterns. So I thought we're looking for patterns and they might be language patterns. They might be behavioral patterns, belief patterns, etc. So the, the point became um, more along the lines of, you know, if we're first, we prepare, now we are looking for something. So we observe. So we prepare, we observe, and then we move into inquiry. Inquiry. We're asking a lot of questions. And I thought this, this totally makes sense, you know, to follow, you know, I come up the, with the phrase freedom point long before I put the acronym together it, but it just sort of, again, evolved that there were certain things that were going to take place. So the inquiry takes place. Then the negotiation is part like the, the where you're leading all that inquiry to is a negotiation with the subconscious. And the ultimate objective is transformation. And that's what we kind of integrate in the last phase of, you know, the whole process. So that's how freedom point came about and and it makes sense because it then it allowed me to consolidate what i used to see as seven components of it down to five and it has such a logical progression that it's it's easy to it's easy to keep your place in the process Mm -hmm. but it's easy also to understand why it takes place in this order you prepare you observe you inquire you negotiate you transform And so this is the essence of freedom point work. And so, you know, the, this structure gives you a very prescribed way to prepare yourself, prepare the client to observe patterns and to learn how to observe. What are you looking for? And what are you listening for? What are the questions they ask? What is their self-talk? What is the what are the metaphors they use? Uh, how do they language their experience? What you know? What frames do they put around their experience? Hmm. So this is the observation. And as the coach, the 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 more effective you get at observation, the more easily you can identify what are the limiters that are, you know, in the way of that full expression of self, the authentic, you know, power within. And so, and inquiry, I mean, this is like breathing to coaches, you have to, you don't tell anybody what to do, it doesn't work. None of us like to be told what to do. And by the way, if you tell the subconscious what to think and what to do, you will get immediate resistance. It is always about inquiry. And you have to be willing and open to seeing, hearing, observing the world from their perspective. And the only way you can do that is by asking questions to get into whatever space they're in. Mm -hmm. Because if you make assumptions, we all know that, you know, that's deadly. Uh You you know, you assume you make an ass of you and me and the, but it, it it's designed to make sure that we don't jump to conclusions, that we don't make assumptions, that we don't impose our own 
version or model of the world onto someone else. And it's real easy to do that. And I've certainly been in, in enough coaching conversations with other people where they jump to that directive place without really yeah it and by the way in freedom point work you you never give direction hmm. you don't ever tell anybody what to do or what to think and so if you can, have, I, can I just stop you real quick um because the observing part i remember from last time when we spoke that you told us about that um uh, car accident that you had that uh, you, everything went buzzy for a while and you started realizing this I think the internal dialogue had stopped for a while and you just like were seeing and acting it was just like this you know do not pass go experience uh, and then your sensory acuity became very sharp and mm-hmm. you were able to see people's emotions you were able to see and sometimes you'd see people transforming from one emotion to another really rapidly right like a stone skipping across the water, you'd say. Um, Is that the same sort of level of observational skills you need in order to observe? No. No. I think that was just, that opening was to give me a level of awareness of what to pay attention to. And so I wouldn't say, although, you know, sometimes I think if you, you do this work long enough, Micro expressions register with you whether you recognize it or not. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so I think I was just more aware of those micro expressions at the time, and they happened so quickly that a part of my brain was registering them before I could give any conscious thought to them, and it was more in reflection that I could see, you know, what actually happened. It was kind of like, wow, that went fast. It was like, you know, like, and it just jumped from one thing to another. Right. But it happened so rapidly that I wasn't conscious of it in the act, more conscious of it in reflection. And so, and just really trying to understand what happened. And so I think it was an education for me in what to pay attention to. And what do you pay attention to? I, well, you know, a lot of coaching, you know, I have a lot of international uh, clients And for years, you know, before the advent of Zoom, uh, you know, there, most of my phone calls were, you know, just auditory conversations. So I developed um, that acuity for listening, Hmm. you know, and sometimes, you know, when you're listening, you know, with a client, you're listening, sometimes something registers like a tone of voice shifts or there's a hesitation, or there's, um, you know, there's maybe some, a little bit of, mm, there's different dynamics that occur when you're listening, whether it's hesitation, or you'll sense uh, a tone of doubt or skepticism. Uh, But you also can, so when you can't see someone, you start to listen for those resistance cues, or those those you know what's in the way of getting deeper into the conversation Uh, but I also realized and you know this is you know one of the things obviously we learn in NLP a long time ago is that that language creates your experience and that we say a lot of things to ourselves and say a lot of things out loud that we don't realize our scripting our experience. Mm. And so, uh, you know, I, I've become very aware of language for a long time. Uh, but, you know, my first career was in real estate. And uh, what I loved about real estate was the negotiation. And it was learning how to say things in the right way, from the right modality to ask the questions that would, would not manipulate people, but influence people to find their real motivation, their real uh, intention and value. Uh, and so I got really good at that because I was learning it from the perspective of influence and leading, but from the point of helping people get clear on what they want, who they are, what they think, what they value, what they feel. And as I learned to, you know, discover that with my clients, 
I could serve them a million times better. Right. Yeah, for sure. And so, so that acuity was developed, you know, partly in a, you know, a sales and negotiation career, Interesting. But, which was exactly what brought me into studying NLP to begin with. So it was like, and when you learn to listen for that, and I also learned that metaphors are golden. Tell us, tell us more about golden metaphors. Well, metaphors are golden because a metaphor gives you not just a belief around a particular experience or a language pattern. It gives you the whole picture of the the rules about how life works, the whole picture of what values are at play, what expectations. Can you give us an example? Well, it's really simple. If people say, you know, that life is a battle then, you know, the whole metaphor is, is you're at war, you know, and the, and that you have to win because if you don't win, the consequences are pretty dire, hmm. you know, that so that, and that you're, you're on the field all the time and that you always have to be on the lookout for the enemy, you know? So it's kind of like if, if someone gives you a metaphor like that, you begin to see, how they paint the picture of their world and what kind of stress does that put on the nervous system? You know, so, uh, you know, if, if someone, you know, and I, and I've learned to play with metaphors a lot over the years and, you know, and a, a lot of my students have asked, you know, how do you do that? And I just go listen for them, just listen for them, because every single thing that the client gives you, you can use if you understand, you know, the power of what they're giving you. Sure. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, for sure. So if a client says that life is a a battle, you recognize that that's the frame that they've put around things. Do you then um, try to reframe it and use a different metaphor to... No, I do not. The interesting about freedom thing about freedom point work, we don't reframe anything. Uh huh. We don't reframe anything. So you let the person go on battling and worrying. No, you don't do that either. It is not about the reframe. It you know that the the preparation is you know all about creating the relationship and the rapport. The observation is to find out what are the patterns. What are the metaphors? What's the language? What's the emotional fuel that drives them on a regular basis? What is their belief structure around a variety of things, whatever they're struggling with or or confronting at the moment? Then you go into inquiry. And what happens in inquiry, you see, is this is, and this is right up your alley, Doug, because this is where we go into a very mild trance state. This whole conversation is generally a closed eye process. Some people are really good at connecting and tuning it with their body and visualizing without their eyes closed. But I find that setting it up as a closed eye process helps the the client stay really inwardly focused in the process. So when we go into that trance-like state, we begin the inquiry. And so I, I look at the list of patterns that have been revealed, the metaphors, the, the languages, the question, the emotions. And I ask in this level of connection where, if anywhere, and by the way, pay attention to this phrase, if anywhere, where, if anywhere, inside or outside the body, is this information present? And what happens is, I, I've only, I think I've only had one experience in, in thousands of sessions where someone could not identify the location of this energy. And that, and oftentimes, surprisingly enough, the energy is not inside the body. Sometimes mm. it's outside the body. Mm. Sometimes it's behind them as a, f- a push. Sometimes it's a pressure pushing down on them. Mm. Sometimes it's um, a shield in front of them. Some, you know, it, it, it how it sets up is is quite fascinating. But the question always is, 
where, if anywhere, because if you say, where is it? And they say it isn't anywhere, you're screwed, you know, uh-huh. because you've already taken them down a path where they are doubting their experience. Right. So it's where, if anywhere, inside or outside the body is this information, because sometimes in the beginning, I would ask where in the body is this loca- is this information? And they'd say, well, it isn't anywhere. And then I I would realize the doubt and skepticism would step in. And so the script has modified a number of times uh, to to circumvent that resistance and skepticism. So it's where, if anywhere, because the answer then, whatever the answer is, is accurate. If they say it's nowhere, I'll say, great, then let's move on to another, Mm -hmm. another, you know, uh, another energy. And so... Uh, so then it, it's, where is it inside or outside the body? And once we've gone through, let's say they present five patterns to you that you want to work with in a session, and you've identified where all these little places, where all these little energies hang out in or around the body. And then I ask the question, where does the body want us to go first? Because what you think is the issue mm. may often times not be the issue the body will sometimes reveal things that you think are so innocuous and un unimportant and irrelevant only to find out uh, 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 no this is the actual key to it all wow. and so uh so then once once we've located all of these you uh-huh. know energies um representations in and around the body, then a new level of inquiry occurs. And I will have conversations direct with the information, the energy in the body. It's kind of like if you think about like a a parts integration, you talk to the parts of the body, right? In this particular case, I'm talking to the information and it is not a separate part of the body. It's an, it's an energy of information present in the body. I never separate parts of the body, ever. Okay. You know, that everything is, is uh, treated as a whole organism. Okay, so, and I will ask crazy questions like, I'll ask the, the, the pattern, the energy, How long have you been in service to this individual? And this is where some of the most exciting part of my work began, because I have heard questions like, you know, since age two, since in the womb, forever, always. And when when I would get the answer forever and always or always, that led me to ask the question, when you say that, do you mean before conception? do mean in the womb or after birth and i was surprised at how often i would get information like before conception Mm. and then i would ask the question ah are you an inherited energy and sometimes they would say yes sometimes they would say no Mm. and then if and i would you know, if they'd say, I am inherited, and I'd say, and what part of your lineage do you come from? You know, uh, and of, of this person's lineage, do you come from? So I have, because of the information that's presented to me, I've, you know, evolved tons of questions about, you know, where do we go from here? And I have had many a client have past life experiences where they'll bring up, you know, I've been here you know, seven lifetimes, I've been in service to this person for this long. And I, I I'll go and ask, and I'll ask. So if you've been here this long, and you've in this, you've been in service with such dedication, what's your job? What did you come here to do? And this is where things get fascinating. And the most common answer is I'm here to protect so let me just stop you one more time. So um, 
you're talking to the information you're talking to yes, the energy and how mm-hmm. are you getting the answers is the person speaking for them well i the way i set it up is uh um, there's a couple of little nuances you're going to have me teaching every single thing i know right here. <laughs> okay. so yeah, the, the first thing the the first thing that we do as we go into this as we go into the trance state i invite the conscious mind to step back and invite the conscious mind to take notes because the information that will be revealed is not readily available to the conscious mind. But once the conscious mind has this information, it will be able to use all of it in service to the greater good of this individual. And then I will say to the client, I will ask questions of these energy centers or these, you know, these information centers and they will respond, but they will respond to you. I cannot hear them. I cannot see them. So I have to rely on you to respond as accurately as you can without criticizing, censoring, judging, filtering, or even the need to understand. I said, because oftentimes things will come forward that make no sense at all, none. And I promise you, though, that before these conversation is complete, every bit of it will make sense. And it always does. So this is the negotiation part of this point. No, this is kind of the setup. Oh, this is the setup. This is as you're going, you know, just as you enter the trance phase. Okay. And then the conversations begin. And the conversations are direct with the information, but obviously the client must convey what they're experiencing. I have clients who are so visual, they will tell me in great detail the imagery that is coming. Uh uh, You know, and sometimes it is so elaborate, it's mind blowing. It's like you're working with an artist who's giving you every detail of the painting. Uh And sometimes it's a one word answer. Sometimes it's a, a a phrase, a paragraph, uh, or sometimes it's, it's a perspective, you know, and so it, and I'll ask the question. So here, here's where, here's why we don't reframe anything. Okay. When we get into the conversation, we're saying, okay, you've been here a long time. You have an important job to do. What did you come to do? Well, I had a client yesterday and the issue that she was dealing with, she felt disrespected in her work environment. And so this real, there was some just real turmoil around this feeling of disrespected. And so I asked, you know, how long have you been here? What's your job? Well, my job is to make sure that she learns to respect others. Now, when you hear that someone has been disrespected and that the emotion called disrespect says, hey, by the way, I'm here because I want to teach you how to be respectful of others. I want to show you why that's important. I want to show you how to create that in your relationships. And it's like, whoa. Who would have thought that disrespected was here to teach you how to respect? And the interesting thing is, you see, in the inquiry process, as I say, okay, okay, what's your strategy for doing that? So I'm talking to the information. If your job is to teach respect, how do you do that? What's your strategy? What have you done in the past? Mm -hmm. And then I ask, what's the benefit of that? How has that benefited this person? What's the upside of your strategy? But here's the thing in all limiting patterns and the thing the subconscious has never considered until this conversation is the downside. Uh What's the downside of that strategy? Uh, The downside is that you think respect comes from others. The downside is that your feeling of being respected is dependent on how other people see you. The downside is it makes you extremely, uh, you know, like overzealous in pleasing others. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and it's good. And so the subconscious is going, oh, wait a second. My intention was to protect you. My intention was to teach you respect for, you know, 
especially for your elders and your seniors in, in this particular case. But the subconscious said, that's what I came to teach you. And I've been with you a really long time. And I have taught you great levels of respect for your parents, for your peers, for your educators, for your uh, for your mentors. And but the downside, oh, I didn't even think about that. And we have to start looking at what is the downside of that. And then so then the conversation, here's where the negotiation begins. Then I'll say, did you, is that what you intended? And the answer is always no. Mm-hmm. I never intended that downside. Right. I was so focused on the upside. I didn't look at the downside. Yeah. So I'm like, I didn't see the signs or I wasn't paying attention. And so I ask, well, if you could change it, if you could deliver all of that upside and eliminate the downside, would you do it? And I, and I will tell you that occasionally the answer has been no. Mm-hmm. And I'll say, oh, you, you say no. Can you tell me why? And, you know, it's, it's really funny because sometimes I see these emotion patterns as like overprotective parents. Uh, they're not willing to let go. Yeah. And it'll say something like, well, she'll fall apart without me. You know, I am the source of her strength, you know, that she won't know how to operate in the world without my, you know, without my guidance. And I will tell you that these energies speak from a very direct persona that, you know, I'm here. This is my job. I'm doing my job. I'm good Mm -hmm. at my job. Don't ask me to leave, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, but so far, I've never had a situation where I couldn't coax the subconscious into performing a higher level of service to enhance the upside, to do an even better job, and to eliminate the downside. And this is the negotiation. Okay. So what has to happen for this to change? Do you need to change the rules of how you work? Do you need to bring in another resource to partner with? Do you need to um, change the, the belief structure around, or do you need to change your focus? Instead of disrespect, do you need to focus on Mm, self-respect? Do you know? And so essentially you're negotiating with a subconsciously locked in pattern that was put in place to do an important job. And it's not going anywhere until it is absolutely certain that that person is going to be better off, that the job that it came to do is more than covered. And oftentimes what will emerge in these conversations. And and I I kind of, depending on how much resistance shows up, I will ask, okay, what are the strengths that you have helped this individual cultivate? It might be stamina, perseverance, courage, determination, resourcefulness, creativity, thousands of options to come up with. And it will share whatever those is. Uh, and whatever those things are. And then I will ask, you know, can I ask you, how old was this person when they learned to read? And they'll say, you know, maybe four, five, six, seven. And I'll say, great. Once they learned to read, did their reading teacher have to stay with them indefinitely? And the answer is usually no. No, they, they've mastered the skill. They're free to move on. And I said, so is that what you are? Are you one of those teachers that came to help them master this particular strength or skill or gift? Mm-hmm. And I say, and then I'll ask the question. So is it time for you to either teach something else or to perform a different function? Or is it time for you to go? And you know, probably about 50% of the time, they'll say it's time for me to go. And then, so it's pretty darn clever, wouldn't you say? Yeah, amazing. And and so is that the point of transformation there? And it's the point of agreement. Okay. That's the freedom point. Because now I'm free to, the, the pattern is free to shift focus, to release, 
to upgrade, to partner, to collaborate, to do all kinds of things. It's even free to integrate with another resource. And these are some of the nuances that have emerged in probably the last two years. Because before, I was really focused on limiting patterns. And now I, I know that, that in this work, we are free to integrate power patterns to bring wow. self-confidence and courage and trust into one integrated energy, amplifying all of the capacity around each, each of those elements. So there's, it is, it is a point of, it's the, it's the point of transformation, but it's also the point of creation that you can work with the subconscious. It has no limitations. It, you know, whatever, you know, so I'm, I'm, I look for what resource would you write to bring into play? What other resources would you need? What things, and, and I'll, and oftentimes too now, I'm not just looking for limiting patterns. I'm looking for power patterns. I'm looking for what are the strengths that are also a huge part of the identity of this individual. And I've, I've even found that in some sessions, I can look at, you know, because remember now I have a diagram in front of me. I have a human body and I have written on that diagram where these information points are. And so I would, hold, on, look, hold on a second. So you, you have a little literal diagram you've drawn a diagram. I, yeah, I, and I, I've become very clever because I, I, I don't use stick figures, but I use like little snowman figures, you know. Uh, so if I don't have if I don't have my charts in front of me, you know, with a, the full body, you know, front and back, I'll just in you know in my in my journal or in my notebook, I'll just draw uh-huh. little snowman type figures and. I'll label where all these things are, but now I have a visual of where these emotion resources are and where Mm -hmm. these patterns are. And sometimes I will look at strengths and go, Oh my God, if I could bring together that strength, that strength, and that strength, it would completely negate all of those limitation patterns. So I explore. And sometimes I, and as I do that, then I'll test what happens when those power patterns are integrated. What happens to fear? What happens to doubt? What happens to disrespected? What happens to insecurity? What happens to worry and overwhelm and all those other things? And oftentimes they dissolve. Seriously, they dissolve when you magnify the resources and you integrate them to an even more powerful energetic presence. It's real energetic presence because what, you know, was the impetus behind this is and it really clarified why this works. Uh, so many years ago, I was watching a Discovery Channel documentary on string theory and quantum mechanics, uh-huh. and and there was a a, a point at which it, you know the the narr- the narrator was talking about you know that it's everything is energy and information. Everything is energy. It has a frequency, and that frequency carries information. And I thought, ah, if everything is energy and information and carries a frequency, why would the emotion system be anything different? Mm -hmm. And so I approach all of it from a, a very objective perspective. It is merely energy information vibrating at a particular frequency that has a specific job to do. I want to know what that job is. I want to know what's the upside, what's the downside. I want to know how to negotiate a better strategy. And oftentimes what that does, well, all the time, it changes the frequency because every single pattern, every single thing we do has a frequency attached to it. Every thought has a frequency. And so we shift the frequency, we shift the operating patterns, we change behavior on an automatic level. And so the program is reset. So that's how the transformation occurs. Well, okay. Thank you. Now I understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, with your background, though, you probably, 
you know, with your background, you probably do understand. Oh my God, she's pu- pulling together all of these pieces. And, you know, sometimes what, what I'll do at the end of a session, depending on, you know, where I think the client is at, then I'll do future pacing mm-hmm. and, you know, introduce uh, scenarios to see what is the, what's the new reaction? What's the new perspective right. kind of thing. So, cool. so. So obviously, and so right. as, as you can see, what I love about the work is I can get very creative with it, but it still always follows the same form framework, you know, uh-huh. and so it's about getting creative with uh, the, the power of the subconscious. And so basically, this gives you a framework is what you're yes. saying. Yes, so point is the framework. Prepare, observe, inquire, negotiate, transform. And there's a lot of freedom in most of those elements. And, and But yet, the first thing you have to master is just the basic structure of it and how to guide it. And with practice, you you know, as with anything, you, you just get more more insights and, uh-huh. and more creativity. And, and I will tell you that the, the framework works so beautifully. I was teaching a workshop a couple of years ago and uh, one of the gals that was attending, uh, she flew in from out of state and she didn't want to come alone. So she dragged her 20 year old brother with her who is a software programmer, a gamer, you know, designs games, right? Uh-huh. He had zero interest in being in this class. I mean, zero, but he was a good sport and just kind of played along and went through the motions. And at the end of the the workshop, you know, part of it was we would have the participants invite a guest who would come into the workshop and Mm -hmm. work with the students, uh, but they couldn't work with anyone that they knew. And so this 20 year old, skeptical programmer um, was working with a a woman um, and I don't remember what her particular challenges were. I only remember that at the end of the workshop, the guests were able to give their feedback. Um, They gave feedback to the students, but then they could share with the, the whole audience as well. And this woman said, I cannot believe it, but this kid just revolved, resolved something that I've been in therapy for, for seven years. Huh. And, and I thought, okay, now if we can uh, take someone who doesn't know what the hell they're doing, has no interest in coaching, and we can give them a framework to follow and support the, the, the process, and they can get that kind of results. Yeah, yeah. That was that was the I'm testament talking. to me that yeah, I true. knew that I knew I could trans that I could translate the work that I could give someone a a fairly simple uh, formula to follow that with a little bit of practice and and you know the the guidance of how do you begin the trans state yeah. what are the inquiry questions what are you know how do you facilitate the experience and you know and it was a two day training class and at the end of two days if you can get that kind of result uh, to me that speaks volumes to what's possible and you know so if you pursue coach any coaching modality to that level of mastery yeah yeah Um, sure hey let me just stop you you mentioned along the way somewhere that um you changed the script and there's not a script for this is there there are scripts yes they're 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 and they're not ironclad but the induction script yeah i'm very particular about And that's about how you guide someone into a mild trance state. And it's not deep hypnosis because they know everything that's going on. They remember everything. The conscious mind is fully aware of the, the insights and distinctions that come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, and the client is often very often surprised by the brilliance that comes from within them, the wisdom, the insights, the knowledge, it's mind blowing. Uh, so, but I am extremely specific on that script. Interesting. That is the key to 
get into that altered brainwave state where you do have access to the subconscious. You also have to have a little insight as to recognize when they're not in state, when they're not in mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, you know, what are the clues that you look for uh, in, in those situations? And how do you, how do you get back into that? You know, so there, there, you know, like any modality, there's, there are certain things that you really need to understand about how the modality works. And then the inquiry questions, there is a script. It's, you know, where, if anywhere, like I said, that wording is very, very yeah, important. Yeah. Where, if anywhere inside or outside the body is this information. And then, you know, then it's always some version of how long have you been here? What's your job? Okay. Your real intention. What's the upside? What's the downside? It's a specific formula, yeah. you know. And there are things, and there are some things that are optional. There are some things that are not. I'm going to have to um, stop the conversation. Unfortunately, we're kind of reaching the, our our time limit here, and I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I know that you used to call this success matrix. Is that right? Well, success matrix is the name of my company. Okay. Uh, but I, I used to call it the emotion matrix. Oh, no, okay. Because to me, you know, that what we're dealing with is a matrix of energetic patterns. Gotcha. And, and as much as that made sense to me, it didn't always make sense to, <laughs> to yeah. my clients. And I found it a little more challenging to explain. And I still see it that way. Yeah. You know, it, that it, it's a matrix of emotional patterns that are, are hardwired, you know, into right. the nervous system. And so, um, and I love the movie, The Matrix. So, yeah. you know, I was going to ask you that because um, you also, at some point, you said you used the term um, download as yeah. if this, this pattern had sort of been downloaded from another source that re- yeah. reminded me of the matrix like when oh yeah Leo had to download the, the well and, and the interesting thing about the comparison to the matrix is most of the 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 belief patterns we run are downloads from other mm. sources yeah. you know teachers parents uh you know religious leaders you know yeah. uh, social constructs so they're true. downloads of somebody else's expectations of you and that have been actually imprinted in your nervous system mm. so so it's kind of like okay and, and I realized, too, that the difference between change and transformation, change is work. It requires conditioning. It's like building a muscle. You have mm. to keep working that muscle and mm. to condition it. And as soon as you stop the conditioning, things atrophy. Mm. Now, transformation is different because it isn't change. It's, it's a something is, is transformed from what it was into something else oh, that is so interesting yeah and yeah. so there is no conditioning required and that's what i yeah. tell people and people say so what's my homework what do i have to do what do i have to focus on and my assignment to my clients is notice what's different notice how you respond differently to your world to the triggers to your environment to your expectations notice how you show up differently in the world because it's never about what's going on around you. I don't give a damn how terrible and complicated it is. It's always about what's going on within you. Nice. I think that's a beautiful place to leave this. Thank you, Deborah Battersby. You are amazing. Thank you. Well, can I tell you that you know at least share with your uh, with your listeners that I have a, a workshop coming up, a free workshop on uh, September 2nd. So if you want to know more about some of the elements of how I do this, uh, you know, uh, reach out to me and, um, you know, just email me at deb at successmatrix.com. Okay. And, and I'll just make sure that my team gets you the, the details you need. Deb at successmatrix.com. And I'll tell you, and you get all the details about our free uh, workshop coming up on September 2nd. I will make note of it. Thank you so much, Deborah Battersby. You're welcome. Well, that does it for another episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thanks so much for being here. 
Hope you enjoyed this episode. I certainly enjoyed having you here. Hey, if you want more information about Sleight of Mouth, you can find it at EssentialCoachingSkills.com, or you might even check out SleightofMouth.org. That's a nice website, too. Thanks. Stay safe. Stay curious.